which is smaller, small grains of sand in this world of ours. But can we control our world? Or are we all subjects of a conspiracy? There have been concentration targets outside the sea. The chemical composition is yellow, so lights in the sky are not part of the sector. We have no world that I think is going to make it. You said yourself, there's no end to this thing. Because there is no end to this thing. Have you ever looked up and seen the sky full of white lines from every direction? These lines come from aeroplanes and are called contrails, short for condensation trails. A part of the plane's exhaust, made up mostly of water and ice. But while contrails are usually thin and soon disappear, there are others that spread and hang in the air. Some people believe that they are part of something more sinister. They are often called chemtrails. It began in the mid-1990s when people started to notice more and more thick white lines in the sky. They are believed to be made out of chemicals that someone is deliberately spraying. There are several theories as to why. Perhaps they're part of so-called geoengineering, introducing metallic particles into the atmosphere to block the sun's rays and slow down global warming. Or are they attempts to control the weather for use as a weapon? to spread disease to reduce the population, or to affect crops and thus make money by gambling on harvests. But still, exactly why we are being sprayed, and by whom, remains unclear. One of the first people to take up the issue of chemtrails back in the 1990s was Clifford Carmichon, a land surveyor and research scientist who has worked for the American Department of Defense. Clifford became concerned about worsening air visibility and traces of metallic particles containing aluminium and barium on the ground in his home state of New Mexico. Now Clifford has set up his own institute to research chemtrails and other issues which he feels present a danger to humans and the planet. He receives samples of things which have fallen from the sky from others who share his concerns all over the USA and the world. But he says the authorities ignore him. What happened is uh, started in 1999, this particular sample, like I say, when EPA received it. Uh, first samples were from California. Uh, I got three samples from three different parts of the United States, in Oregon, California, and they all are identical. When you, when you start getting under the microscope, which is another part of this work here, right. it's highly unusual material in terms of the internal structure of it and what's going on. So these samples came across from various places in the, in the United States then. Um, they are reported um, internationally. Um, it's an airborne filament, is what it is. How do, I, well, one question is, how do you know it's an airborne filament? I mean, because they were seen. They were they were seen. Uh, they were seen in the air by some of the down through the air. Some of that's right. And then the way it lands, yeah. okay, the way it lands on the vegetation, this type of thing, will show that it's a process of descent, okay? The big question with that sort of thing is, why would uh, any authority want to introduce unknown things into the environment? The common um, sort of interpretation of what we're speaking of is that this is all about uh, weather control. In fact, some program to mitigate global warming. Is, isn't that perceived as something beneficial to right. the inhabitants of the planet as well as the planet? If it's beneficial, wouldn't it be discussed openly? Why, why would you have a program that is purportedly beneficial to the inhabitants of the planet, but there's no discussion about it, right? There's no proper analysis. Why would you have such a thing? It doesn't, it doesn't compute just from a logical standpoint. In a series of films called What and then Why in the World Are They Spraying, producer Michael J. Murphy argues that chemtrails are a real and present danger. Here, author and activist Dr. Nick Begich argues that the American military is aiming for weather control. Environmental manipulation is like the ultimate uh, method of covert warfare because you can literally shut down food production. You can create a situation where the people within a country revolt against their own government. And you're invited in to mop up the mess. The issue of owning the weather by 2025, which is a military publication we quoted it as far back as, I think, 94, 95, even. Um, but you go back to these earlier reports, and you look at sort of what was the objective. And the objective is exactly that, control the battlefield environment. Uh, I have yeah. heard that, that um, just to, on, a, on a side issue here, 
the, the U.S. Air Force has a document which um, uh, aims at, a po as a policy, that aims at having control of the weather by the year 2025. Sure, owning the weather by 2025. Sure, that's a, that's a public so document. So is a, a part of that, do you think? Controlling well, the weather? Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's right in here. Weather modification is possible, okay? Uh -huh. They talk about changing the chemical composition of the atmosphere in here, mm. okay? But why would they want to do that? I mean, this, if you change that to, to everybody's uh, home. Oh, oh, not everybody. No, no, no. Re region. Look at look at the opening. Oh, region. Region. Look at this. Method and operator, apparatus for altering a region. Okay. Okay? So maybe I can do it anywhere, uh -huh. but if I can direct it yeah. and target it. Right. That is a different story, so right? you've got an enemy country, uh, and you think, okay, we'll, what we do is we'll make the make their atmosphere unbreathable. Okay, that sort of thing. Is that what you mean? Or, or something uh, like that? Or, or I, I introduce particulate matter of a certain that has a certain effect on you, puts you to sleep. Yeah. Makes you uh, makes you um, sick. Yeah. Uh, whatever. Whatever. Okay. You, you give me ideas, I can come up with lots of ideas. <laughs> what do I want to do to disable you? Yeah. We're looking at this from a military standpoint. Mm -hmm. What do I want to do to disable you? So this is a treasure chest yes, for, right. for a future generation of, of military operations, really. Well, well yeah, absolutely. And, and remember, this is the public side. This is not just an imaginary um, idea. Can we control the weather? It would be a really powerful weapon if it could be done. All we know for sure is that many have tried. For instance, during the Vietnam War, the U.S. Army made it rain to slow down the enemy. But trying to control the weather is dangerous. In the early 1950s, the British Air Force conducted an experiment called Project Cumulus. The goal was to control the rain for warfare purposes. In August of 1952, they were using dry ice, or silver iodide, to make it rain in the southern part of England. Later that week, Almost 90 million tons of water swept through the town of Lynmouth, killing 35 people and leaving over 400 homeless. It has not been proved that the rain was caused by the experiment, but the British government cancelled the project after this incident. Due to the potential danger of weather control for military purposes, the UN banned it in 1977. After that, the research has been focused on preventing disasters like hurricanes and tornadoes. But many people believe that this ban has had little effect, and that experiments to control the weather have been carried out in secret ever since. Whether the theory of why chemtrails are being sprayed is military weather control, or geoengineering, or a way of controlling crops, the idea that it is a conspiracy against humanity has provoked many people into action. On the streets of London, English builder Max Bliss is trying to raise awareness about the danger. It's a multifaceted. There are many, many different... You don't have a program of this scale without there being uh, many benefits for the people that are willing to go to these lengths to have this huge clandestine program. Um, controlling the weather has many benefits for them from their point of view. They can use it for geopolitical reasons. If, you, if you're, you've got a weather weapon and you can control the weather, you can put nations under pressure to submit to your policies. I certainly believe that weather warfare has more than one aspect to it. If you spray the air, we're all going to breathe it. And, and who, yeah. who are the people who are going to avoid it and, and stay healthy? If, if, if there is a program, they're aware of what they're doing. Therefore, they can take precautions. Now, uh, already in the UK, they forecast ahead that there will be 30% drop in wheat yield. Now, that's you can start to see where I might be going with this. If you can control the weather and you can control food supply, you can make huge profits because if you control the supply of, of, that, of that item in demand, you can charge more money for it. Oh, I've been doing research into this, and I think this is about weather. Uh, weather modification. And when we look at our weather, well, it depends what their motivation is. Where's the smoking gun? Where's the, where, what's the crucial bit of evidence that, that tells us that this is actually happening? Um, well, it's, it's 
I don't know, the smoking gun is the visual change in the atmosphere. I mean, most of us can easily go and have a look at pictures of the past. Uh, there are, are no chemtrails in the sky. I, I believe that many of the scientists and many of the people doing geoengineering will sincerely believe they are doing something for the system, there, there is, If there is an elite that are deciding to, to spray us like this, they are, are avoiding the, uh, the effects by eating the right food, Absolutely. drinking the right water. Well, when we think about food, um, I certainly wouldn't want to point out the fact that most, most rich people now eat organic food. It's quite well publicised that a lot of people in uh, the presidency have their organic farms and, uh, you know, the elites have got their seed banks, they've got, they, they've got the technology, they're prepared for potential catastrophe. The facts themselves are there. This isn't a theory, this is fact. But the world is full of facts. And reaching out to grab various facts doesn't necessarily mean they strengthen your argument. Rich people have access to more resources, it's true. But does that mean they're involved in this particular conspiracy? There are facts that argue against chemtrails. Mechanically, it's not so complicated. Step up here and I'll show you. See this little trigger here? Well, that's a part of the pen we write with. When the trigger is pulled back, it opens a valve which permits chemicals to shoot out into the exhaust pipe. The exhaust pipe, being just about red hot, heats up the chemicals and makes the smoke you see from the ground. It's easy to find pictures and videos of alleged chemtrail planes online. But are they real? They look convincing. Large barrels of chemicals are lined up. There are nozzles and hoses and spray. But they are also found on other sites as well, with completely normal uses. An aeroplane to measure air quality. Another plane used for firefighting. Skeptics love nothing better than to debunk or prove false such photos. Is it really a new phenomenon? There are old pictures and articles containing contrails that date from before the mid-1990s. Even long-lasting and spreading contrails. Here, for instance, in this footage from the Second World War. Or in this book about clouds from 1880, we can see clouds that look like chemtrails. Back in New Mexico, the American state where Clifford Carnicom began highlighting chemtrails, scientist and lecturer Dave Thomas heads a society of skeptics and has often argued against the conspiracy in the skies. I've, I've looked at this chemtrails phenomenon a lot, and, and one of the claims of the chemtrail people is that the chemtrails really changed in the late 90s and before then they were totally different and and since then now they're you know sinister and thick and you have these uh, crisscross patterns and, and you have planes that turn the jets on and, and turn them off turn the jets on and and as far as you know they're not being strange looking contrails before the 90s that's just not true there is all sorts of evidence all the way back to World War II, you know, there's beautiful pictures of World War II bombers making these incredible arrays of what now would be called chemtrails. One of the uh, evidence claims of chemtrails is that now, you know, we have these crisscross patterns of, of spraying, and, and really what those are is, is traffic patterns, you know, planes uh, go in these east-west grids at certain altitudes, north-south, uh, travel lanes at different uh, altitudes, and, and basically what we're seeing is more air traffic, more airplanes now than there were even in the 1990s. Even in Sweden, the issue has come up. With the representative of the Green Party, one of the few politicians who have dared raise questions about chemtrails. Ilona Riepenen is an associate professor at Stockholm University who studies what are called aerosol particles in the atmosphere. Of course I understand people's concern, for instance, for their uh, health. And I think that people should be concerned about air quality and their health. But, but I would, I would um, knowing a little bit about the atmosphere and how it works and how the aerosols work, I would, I would look for the, let's say, I would look for the reasons or the problems um, from a bit closer right. um, than 
on the contrails, I must say. Is that something the scientific community is talking about, though, this idea of geoengineering or, or, or affecting the climate in some way? Yes, there is research on it, and I think it's very important that there is research done on it so that uh, so that our understanding on on um, if 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 people are speculating on doing doing these sorts of things or trying to influence the climate i think it's really important that uh, there is scientific work done in terms of assessing the potential impacts of if if someone would uh, try one of these geoengineering techniques are you aware of anybody actually trying that or is it just on the theoretical level at the moment i'm not aware of that at least no. can you tell us what is the difference between a contrail these narrow white lines you see in the sky and the ones that spread out and hang around in the air for a long time because those are the ones that are blamed as chemtrails so there is a scientific explanation as to why the different contrails can have different lifetimes um, so to start with uh, explaining how contrails are formed um, what you see as the white material like cloud-like material in the sky is uh, water in liquid or in, in many cases ice phase so what happens when a when a contrail is formed is that the water vapor from the engine exhaust when it cools down it condenses on the particulate matter in the exhaust and forms forms um, particles just uh, like in a cloud basically there's parts of the atmosphere that have more water vapor than others and in certain weather conditions, we can see this clearly. We call them clouds. And you have clouds here, no clouds there. But even when you can't see the clouds, there is variability in the moisture content. There's more moisture here than there is there, even if you can't see the clouds. And as a high-altitude plane flies through there, as it moves through regions of changing uh, moisture, it looks like you know the spray is turning on and turning off. Depending on the uh, atmospheric conditions at the altitude where the airplane is flying, mostly, for instance, how much water vapor there is uh, in the surrounding atmosphere, these uh, contrails that can have very different lifetimes. Okay. So they can, instead of just staying in a narrow strip and then disappearing, they can hang around for, for quite a long time. Mm. If I wanted to actually deliver some biological toxin or agent, delivering it from an airplane that's 30,000 feet up in the air is the absolute worst possible way you could, you could imagine to do that. You have no control. The wind is going to blow it wherever. It's going to blow it to other countries. When we have mosquito season here, we have a little cars that putter around the small towns with putting out the mosquito spray. That would be the way to deliver your biological dose to a controlled population. But just spraying it, you know, 30,000 feet up and letting the wind blow it, that, that's got to be the silliest method of um, biological agent dissemination that's ever been invented. Scientific skepticism towards chemtrails hasn't stopped people being concerned, even terrified at the idea. Conferences and demonstrations are held. Protest groups are springing up everywhere. The overriding fear is that scientists are setting out to remake the atmosphere, to carry out so-called geoengineering, perhaps to solve global warming, ignoring the risks. Simply put, the fear is that scientists are playing God, and there's nothing ordinary people can do to stop them. Do you see, do you foresee a moment in time where the pressure from, from yourself and others in the same field forces some kind of a, an explanation from the powers that be? I'd like to give you a rosy answer and say, oh yeah, I work hard. I come up with my answers. I provide them to the public and everybody acts on them and we take care of business and we get this planet in shape the way it's supposed to be. But if you're counting on it from a limited set of quote authority figures, mm -hmm. history is not on our side right now. The general public, literally the citizens of this planet, they need to assert their ownership and stewardship of this planet. Just assert it. Shouldn't scientists be spreading the alarm? Or are they all involved, paid off by the authorities to keep things quiet? You couldn't get much more established in the scientific community than Piers Forster. 
professor of physical climate change at Britain's University of Leeds. His work is a central part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, which supplies the United Nations with the information on which international policy on the climate is based. Professor Forster was part of a project that used computer models to examine the idea of using aerosol spraying from the air from the Norwegian island of Spitsbergen in order to block solar rays over part of the Arctic and so reduce the melting of the ice. But they soon ran into problems. We ended up having to fly so many airplanes from Spitsbergen. It, I can't remember precisely. It was about ten times the size of Heathrow Airport in the first years, but then it got more and more and more until about a hundred, hundred times the size of Heath, Heathrow Airport flying from Spitsbergen. And that was just to do one thing, and that didn't work very well. We could potentially do geoengineering to try and fix something, something like that. But I do not think we do yet have the technology to do it. If we did find a mechanism of some kind to put a whole lot of aerosols either into the upper atmosphere or put a heat more aerosols into the lower atmosphere, that would definitely cool the earth down. But it doesn't just, it definitely wouldn't just cool down the earth's surface temperature, it would also have quite a lot of effects on things like precipitation, on air quality, and acid pain and things of course, and if we injected it very high into the upper atmosphere, it would have an effect on stratospheric ozone. So what I would definitely, definitely say is that we have good understanding that the physical mechanism is there and it would work. But we also understand too that it would have a lot of complicated effects going on. Complications. They always turn up in the physical world. And they work both ways in terms of conspiracies. The more complicated the realities, the more complex the theory needed to explain why something is being done to control them. World famous conspiracy theorist David Icke complicates the chemtrail issue by connecting it with another strand of the idea that someone is out to affect humanity's health. He points to the way the food we eat is being influenced by modern science. Genetically modified organisms introduced to the human body genetically modifies us, which means that we are not interacting with reality, thought, emotionally, whatever, in the way that we would if we were not being genetically uh, distorted. And what it's doing is dramatically changing um, the human organism and therefore the way we think, the way we feel. People are eating genetically modified food. It is punching holes in their intestines. Normal things, carrots, broccoli, things like that, are then breaking into areas of the body where they shouldn't be. The immune system, alarms go off and they uh, mark that as a danger to the body. Now It's now gone in the coding of the immune system, this is a danger. The next time they have a carrot or broccoli, mm. the immune system kicks in, mm. reacts to it, food allergy. Suddenly they're allergic to uh, carrots and, and broccoli. Why would they do that when they know what it's doing? Because it's part of an agenda, uh, which you could describe as a war on the human body, the human mind, and the human emotions, and it's coordinated. And if we don't start to understand that this is what, what is happening, then we'll, we will allow it to happen, and, and we'll get in Europe what they've got in America, which is a nightmare. Would you place chemtrails as, as part of that, that uh, conspiracy, that, 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 the fact that a way of affecting our, our health? I think chemtrails uh, have a, a number of reasons. What I've found in my research over the years is almost everything that is part of this conspiracy has multiple reasons. He might have a main reason, but there are, sh there, there are offshoot reasons as well. When this, these chemtrails have been tested, they contain aluminium, barium, and other uh, stuff. Uh, aluminium very much connected to things like Alzheimer's disease. It also comes down and drops onto the, to the natural world and, and pollutes that. So the question is, why would anyone do this? Why would they do this? 
Um, f for the benefit of humanity? Of course not. Presumably they've been affected as well, surely, if they're breathing the same air as we are. Well, maybe they're not quite the same as we are. Maybe they're not the same genetics that, as we are, and maybe they're not affected like we are. Maybe, for instance, they have the ability to not just survive, but prosper in a much more radiated atmosphere. We will go deeper into the non-human theory in the last program in our series, when we investigate just who lies behind the alleged plot to control the human race. But is it a conspiracy? You put this t-shirt about the 9-11 inside job. You're a conspiracy theorist, aren't you? You believe in all these conspiracies. Well, when you say all these uh, conspiracy theories, I, I, I believe that some conspiracy theories are disinformation theories to discredit the focus that will start to reveal the facts. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? How those two words have now been targeted so anyone that hears those words will instantly have a reaction. Yeah. They'll have a reaction that says, oh no, I feel uncomfortable, this, that guy's a nutter. Yeah. And, you know, I can assure everyone I'm not. I'm a normal, everyday person. I can't stop it myself, but I can alert everyone else so hopefully everyone else can wake up. And that's the thing. We can stop this. A brief search through the internet will show you the huge number of people who are involved in the fight against so-called chemtrails. Many see scientists like Professor Piers Forster as prime suspects. I think because perhaps I both work on contrails and sharing and hearing, they think perhaps I'm part of this conspiracy. I do have quite a lot of sympathy for them. Because the contact we see are really the most obvious thing we do to the atmosphere. And I would say in all the conversations I've had with policy, people making gun policy and politicians, it's very hard to get them interested in anything. So the fact that I would be very surprised if there was an international community out there interested in doing this stuff. These people who call you about the chemtrails and things, do they accept what you say or do they, are they still suspicious when you finish talking? Um, they do tend to still be suspicious uh, and I just blame that on the internet. Of course the internet is made up of people, their thoughts, concerns and fears. If enough are worried about a topic, especially one as important as the sky we all see and the air we all breathe, then that fear is a serious issue in itself, even if it were to be misplaced. Living in fear of our own planet would be a disaster in itself. We've all seen them up in the sky. Wide trails of white behind jet planes. Are they, as some theorists say, chemtrails? Are governments spraying us for some reason? Are they trying to control the weather? We're not here to prove or disprove this conspiracy theory. We're here to help you decide. Many thanks to Keith Foster and the Swedish mainstream television network that allowed this program to be made. I look forward to critiquing and examining this program and the facts they chose to highlight. And hopefully I will be able to present a broader picture with more facts to reveal the bigger picture. But many thanks. I'm delighted this has made it to mainstream. It's, it's um, an important stepping stone. We've got a lot of work to do and there's an awful lot of information to take on board. But the information is out there. There are many more facts to understand. Take care my friends, please do the research and bye for now.